Hi, Siobhan, we can start now. A warm uh, good morning from sunny South Africa. Um, from myself, Siobhan Thompson and the Wines of South Africa team. Joining me here from Wines of South Africa is Joe Waring and Thelma Deploy. Um, so we are going to have another session of our insider sessions. And today we're gonna to be discussing what does empowerment mean? Um, so I'd like to open up very quickly to say thank you to our sponsor, Westgrow. Um, they have sponsored the insider sessions. And I'd also like to just tell you about one of our initiatives, the Cape Export Network um, is, is an outcome of a collective response from the pandemic. Travel bans, the rise of virtual meetings, focus on digital have all provided South African wine industry with the opportunity to create a portal dedicated to South African wines. It's built to help and expose importers um, to, to South African wines and enlist South African wines. This is the only business to business marketplace dedicated to South African wines. Um, and the concept has been tested with importers globally. And this portal will evolve as it goes along. There's also a technical team um, to support producers, and we are putting a strong marketing focus on this to drive awareness. So to find out more about this, you can go to the website, which is at the bottom of this page, um, and have a look. So if you are out there as an importer and you'd like to take on more South African wines, please do enlist on the portal and um, look out for the wines and then make contact with the various producers. So I'm not gonna take up much more time. I'm gonna hand over, oh, just a quick, uh, some admin. If you have questions for Jancis or the, or the uh, panel today, please post your questions on the Q&A box um, and then we'll get to that after the session. But I'm gonna hand over to Joe now, who's gonna do the introductions. Thanks very much. Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome. So I would like to introduce our chair for the session today, um, Master of Wine, Jancis Robinson, OBE. Jancis, as I'm sure you all know, um, is one of the world's leading wine writers and is hugely respected for her work across the globe. She is the wine writer for the Financial Times, um, as well as running along with her substantial team, the highly authoritative website, um, jancisrobinson.com. Jancis has long been a champion for greater diversity within the wine industry. Um, an example being that she crowdfunded for a group of um, Zimbabwean sommeliers working in South Africa to allow them to train and compete in the World Wine Tasting Championships. She's written many insightful articles on um, diversity within the wine industry, and it's a subject that she's very close to. So firstly, to say thank you very much from Wines of South Africa Jancis for your time chairing the panel today. Um, I'm hand over to you now to introduce our fantastic panel um, and get on with the session. Thank you, Jancis. Thanks, Joe. Well, it's a great pleasure to be with you all uh, and to learn more because I have been, as a, as a white wine writer in the country that's got such a dynamic uh, wine culture, I have been terribly spoiled. And I haven't really needed mentorship um, because as a wine writer, everybody wants to be nice to you because they want a nice mention. Very, very different, of course, if you're a wine producer in today's horribly crowded marketplace, whatever ethnicity you have. And probably being a woman doesn't help either. So I take my hat off to all of the panelists today. And before introducing them specifically, um, I would just like to say that I have a, a particularly keen interest in South Africa. Uh, we ran on jancisrobinson.com a series of um, accounts of particularly interesting up and coming um, South African wine producers, including Praises and Kiaras, as, as, as it happens. Um, and I, I feel that South Africa is uniquely well placed to demonstrate to the whole world, not just within South Africa, just um, how ridiculous it is that so far the, the, the world of wine has been so predominantly white. And I think uh, you can show, you can broaden the whole spectrum of wine achievement um, and, and just show what's, what's possible. And 
lead the world in some respect. So we are going to hear first off from Kiara Scott, a winemaker at Brookdale Estate, who I think would will tell us that she has benefited enormously from having been a, a Cape um, uh, Wine Guild protege. Uh, but your, we, we look forward very much to hearing where you started, Kiara, which certainly wasn't in a, uh, a wine uh, culture, was it? Um, and, I, and, I, and I think you have, you can probably identify some of the legs up that you've had and some of the mentorships and internships that have really made a difference in your life. Uh, then we have Barine Sauls from Tessa Larsdal Wines, um, where you grew up in a tiny village and your journey involved being an, your first entree into the world of wine in a way was when you were taken on as an au pair by the Hamilton Russells, is that right? And then you've, obviously your talents were spotted and uh, it's been onwards and upwards from there, but I won't spoil too much of the story. Um, and then Prezi Dlamini, who has perhaps the broadest scope of experience of, of the three of you in terms of your responsibilities. Um, you've been instrumental in some pretty big companies and have a lot of business experience. And I think you're still studying business management. And you work quite closely with Petrus Bosman, whose family have played a very important part in empowerment and advancement in the South African wine business. And I, for one, would love to hear more from Petrus about how he can influence perhaps some more of his um, peers. I think that would be a, a, a really exciting input for you. So shall we start uh, hearing from Kiara? Hello, hello everyone. Um, it is really special to be here with you all and to share a little bit of my story um, and to chat about empowerment, which is so important um, in the wine industry, I believe. Um, so I'll start at the beginning. I, was, I grew up in Mitchell Spain, and it's not a wine producing or an area that's really known for wine consumption. Um, but I saw a lot of things there. And long story short, that shifted my interest into winemaking um, because but I wanted to learn more. Yes, 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 lovely. Kiara, I, would, I think since I hope that we have some um, people listening and watching who are not South African, I think you should explain exactly a little bit more about where you grew up. Okay. Um, so Mitchell Splain, it's, man, it's like one, you'd call it like a ghetto or it's not really... Um, yeah, it's part of the Cape Flats in Cape Town, uh, and it's mostly where people of color or colored people stay. Um, and there's a lot of socioeconomic circumstances or factors that people in this area are experiencing, um, you know, such as like gangsterism, drugs, and alcohol. So I, I grew up in an area where these, these things were, were more prominent than in other areas, for example. Yes, um, <laughs> that's basically it. And, and seeing that, you know, I, I realized at a very young age that I didn't want to be what I saw. Um, and a lot of young people and friends of mine back then were going down a really wrong and rough path. And I didn't want that for myself. Um, I grew up in a, well, I am still in a very conservative family. So, you know, they were trying trying their best to keep me away from that type of life, you know, and I'm so blessed and thankful for that. Um, but instead of staying away from wine or staying away from these bad things, I decided, you know, to learn about it. Um, because, you know, it, it can be just one thing can either have a good or a good impact or bad impact. And it's what you decide you're going to make of this decision or the circumstance or wherever you grow up. Um, and I decided to learn about it. 
and to have a good outcome. That was my decision. Um, and I decided to learn about wine instead of stay away from it, which is what a lot of people wanted me to do at the time. Um, and I'm so, so glad that I didn't. I'm so glad that I learned about it. And you know, through, through education, you can transform. Transformation through education, basically. Yes, and, and that's what I'm doing now, step by step, person by person, each person that I meet that has this bad perception of alcohol, um, you teach them about it, they want to learn more and automatically there's, there's transformation. So, well, there was, let me go back. Um, I decided I wanted to study winemaking and I joined Altsenburg Agricultural College through the University of Southern Bosch. And I did winemaking there, viticulture and enology. And in my final year of studies, I was approached by the Cape Winemakers Guild by Magda Forster, and she was their representative. And she encouraged me to apply for bursary, which I did, and I was successful. And thereafter, I applied for the protege program, the Cape Winemakers Guild protege program, which has been really, I mean, life changing, life changing. Um, the protege program, they want to do meaningful transformation through education and upliftment. So for people like myself, women or men that come from disadvantaged areas or areas that I grew up in, um, they take young winemakers, graduated winemakers, and they take you on a journey, they walk with you basically um, and teach you things. They do amazing tastings with you. Um, you walk side by side with your mentor. And what's amazing about the program is that you get to spend time with someone that spent the time in the industry. They've made the mistakes, they've learned from it. Uh, maybe it's taken them two vintages or three vintages to learn this thing, but when they meet you and you can have one sitting with them and you learn two years maybe of knowledge in a month, for example, with this particular person. So it is exponential learning with these men and women. And it's not just about I mean, it's about wine, but they're also genuinely interested in who you are as a person, um, your background, um, you know, your mental space, everything. It's not just wine focused, you know, they, they, they focus on the whole package and holistic uh, image of the person. Yeah. So that's basically my story. And then after the protege program, I started to work with Duncan Savage as his assistant winemaker at Savage did, Wines for two years. Did he choose you or did you choose him? <laughs> it's a funny story, that one. Um, <laughs> it is, it's, uh, it's amazing how things work out. So in my final year, I was very nervously looking for placement. And it just so happened that Duncan had just opened his urban winery in Salt River. Um, and I was... Uh, I decided on one evening we're at this event. I'm going to chat to him now about the job. I'm just going to, just going to do it, you know. And then, funny enough, he came to me first, and then he approached me with a position. So it was something that was probably just going to. It was. Me. It was meant, wasn't it? It was destined. Yes. Would exactly. and you've gone on from there to really have a quite an important role, haven't you? Yes. 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 And I mean, after that, I met with Tim Rudd, who's the owner of Brookdale. And then, I mean, long story short, then I became the winemaker of Brookdale Estate, which is it's really fantastic. Um, you know, it's, it's almost full circle. If you think about empowerment, empowerment to me is, you know, taking someone, teaching them, educating them, um, you know, giving them responsibilities once they've shown that they're capable of making good decisions, working hard and then allowing them to go on their own you know and to to stand and to to be able to work and do what they need to do without the people well not without but with less support basically you know so that you can you can show that you're doing it there on your own you know and that's empowerment and then at the end of that you as the empowered person needs to go and take another person that was in your position mm and get them to the same level, if not better. And are you doing that already? 
you getting there? <laughs> <laughs> what lessons would you say you learnt about what makes a good mentor or, or a good uh, person in charge of an intern or apprentice? I think a good mentor trusts opinions, other opinions. I think you, you listen to people, you are teachable. In order to lead, you must be able to, to be taught. Um, you have to listen. Um, and you shouldn't be, to be a good leader, you shouldn't be frightened of people not agreeing with you. Mm -hmm. I think that, that makes a good leader, yeah. Yeah, and, and also you need to work with people that's better than you. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you going to go about deciding who you're going to mentor? Gosh, it's got to be someone that's passionate, that's open to learning, and someone that's willing just to put in the time and the effort. That's it. You can teach, you know, you can teach anyone anything as long as they as the one to be taught. Mm. Yeah. I, yes, I'm interested. I wonder... You're very, obviously, you will be inspiring as an example. And how can we set about publicizing what you've done, which is a great journey, um, and, and giving people more confidence? What do you think? Perhaps you're the wrong person to ask because yeah. you don't <laughs> want to say, oh, I'm, I'm the great, yeah. I am. But... Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, that's such a difficult one. <laughs> um, maybe I can get back to you. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I was very glad that we could at least publicize the publish your story on on our website, because that has, you know, that's that's not just South Africa. We've got people from, you know, 100 different countries visiting. So I hope they were inspired by your story. Yeah. Thank you. Lovely. So shall we go on to Breen? Um, where are you? Let's have a look. Yeah. Where? Let's see. Thank you, Chiara. Maybe we'll come back with some questions or something. Barine, Barine? What's that first? There we go. Good. <laughs> Lovely. Great. Um, is that a shawl or a scarf or something? It's wonderfully. Oh, it's a, yeah. it's a scarf. I'm Lovely. actually underdressed for the weather. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be underdressed for here, I can tell you. Um, they all want to see your face. There we go. So tell us your story, because it's very, very particular, isn't it? Yes. So uh, I'm Berin. I'm originally from Tesselarstal, which is a small village in the heart of the Oberberg. The Oberberg is in the Western Cape, and it is about 20 kilometers northeast from the Yemelin Arde. And the Yemelin Arde is known for winemaking, especially for its cool climate, maritime climate and for producing Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Pinotage, and Sauvignon Blanc. We produce some of the best in the world. Um, Tesla's Dal in the Overberg is known for wheat and for uh, livestock. And Tesla's Dal has got a unique uh, story or history. Um, so I'll quickly explain Please, about that. Yes, it's, yeah. it's, it's where, um, so Johannes Tesla, he was a, a lieutenant or captain uh, in the Dutch army in the 1700s. And he got paid with a, uh, two pieces of property and about eight Khoisan slaves. And in 1810, he left the property and money to his then freed slaves. So I'm a descendant of those slaves and my parents still live there. Um, my mother is the real Tesla Staller, basically. <laughs> so how I grew up, just to uh, give you a touch on where I come from, how I grew up was, I was born in 1982. So when I grew up, they were still carting with donkey carts. So that was a means of transport. And we only got electricity in 1993 or 1994 that time. Um, and it's a water scarce area as well. So I can remember everyone just had like water storage and we just used it sparingly. And we used it from a spring that came from the mountain. And my grandmother used to farm with goats. Oh. So, so they traded with Stanford, which is also another winemaking area in the Overberg. But um, uh, like the Clean River uh, Mountain divides us. But she and my mother used to walk, my mother used to tell me they used to walk every Sunday across that mountain 
whether goats to trade for alcoholic beverages. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Can I just ask, sorry, the, the, um, the 1810, the guy who left his land yeah. to the Do freed slaves, how common was that? Was that no. very unusual? No, very unusual. Yeah. I think he's the only guy that did that. Mm. Yeah, he's the only guy that did that. Um, from there, the uniqueness of Tesla Zal. I mean, we, I can almost say like, it's almost like apartheid past Tesla yeah. Zal yeah. because everyone just kept on making a, like a poor farm living. And uh, my parents, my, I was very ambitious. My mother is a, was a primary teacher. Um, you know, my dad was a paramedic. So they basically, you know, didn't work for, they didn't farm really. Um, but I used to travel with my mother because she, she taught on all the farms around Tesla's Dal. So and not a school? Or there, there, were, kind of... there were different little farm schools right. everywhere, right. you know, primary schools. And um, I can tell you, uh, Jensis, my first meeting with wine was really uh, I don't know if you guys know, but there was a thing called the Dobstel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where workers were paid partly in alcohol, yes? On the farms, yeah. The farm, yeah. Or they were paid full with the alcohol in some instances. Oh. So most of those farms that my mother worked with, I traveled with. I'm the youngest of three siblings. They stayed in Tesla's Dal. And I basically, that was where I saw the payment with the Dobstel. So um, a lot of uh, uh, children that was born with fetal alcohol syndrome and you know, uh, the, the husband hitting the woman and, and stuff like that. So, so farming, agriculture as a well, whole and wine and all those things was really not seen as uh, something of class. It wasn't per perceived as something that you, you must stay away from that really. And I can remember my school upbringing as well. I went to a lot of different schools. But in the end, in Swat Bay, and I can remember all of my peers wanted to be a policeman, um, a, a military guy, because that, that was seen as people that, that was taken care of by the government, that they got paid, they got the houses, and they got the cars, mm. and they didn't have fetal alcohol syndrome babies and stuff. Mm. <laughs> so so mm. that, was, that was my meeting with it. And um, my grandma used to make a brew herself, you know. So I can say I come from a family of beverage making. <laughs> um, <laughs> she made it out of anything that could ferment really like old pieces of bread raisins and that time they had like these yeast cakes so that would go into that bucket and yeah she had a name for it as well she called it Skufan but yeah that was my my experience um, and my community's experience of wine there was a lot of abuse with it so I came to work just after when I finished school I came to work on Hamilton Russell Vineyards so now I'm done with school, not sure what to do. I have to go earn some money. My mother's rule in the house is if you turn 18, you must have your driver's license and get the hell out. <laughs> um, so I knew my time was, was coming because my brother <laughs> left and my sister left. And now it's me. And, you know, I have to leave Tesla's doll. It's this little town. And, uh, yeah, I came to work on Hamilton Russell Vineyards as the OP. Um, had the interview with, with Anthony and Arabella at the time. And yeah, I got the job. And um, I can tell you how, luck, how lucky can a girl be. I came to work on a wine farm that was that has this great history and was known for its quality Pinot Noir and Chardonnay production. And so my real meeting uh, with wine was these great wines, Hamilton, Russell, Vineyard, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and all the older vintages and the great ones. But before that, I was looking after the kids and a month into this, Anthony basically steered me away from looking after the kids because he recognized the ambition. Now I was very curious. My mother always said I would be a journalist one day because I was very nosy, very curious, love to gossip. Um, it's, by the way, it's a trait that I left. <laughs> but uh, um, no, well, that was, that was it. And, I basically, a month after um, I cared for the kids, for his four daughters, I started in the office assisting Talita Engelbrecht, who, was, uh, who is the marketing manager for Hamilton Russell Vineyards. I can say since forever, but this year marks her 30th year at Hamilton Russell. Gosh, yeah. And um, 
it just worked. I mean, I started here and I basically inquired, but I see, you know, you sell wine here. Why do people pay so much for the wine? You know, that's basically what I wanted to know. And Anthony said, look, why don't you ask, you know, the vineyard manager and the winemaker if you can assist them and see the different processes. That was now deep into March. The harvest was done already. Kevin Grant was the winemaker then here at Hamilton Russell Vineyards. And I then soon moved into the wine admin and certification side of things. So yeah, pull the samples for the inspectors uh, for service and do all the, those documentation. Then I um, started assisting with the bottling and the labeling in those departments. And I got a team of six ladies to help me with that. Um, yeah, in that month, I also started this, uh, operating the forklift because I thought I'm going to prep myself now, like for the harvest to come. So then, you know, I'll, I'll be useful. In that time, I trained three other ladies up on that forklift. Um, all got licensed. Um, and also, uh, I think the year following, um, I introduced them to ABET because I knew another lady doing ABET um, because no one had really matric certificates or something. And everyone What's just went... If, uh, yeah, ABET. ABET? Oh, it's like if you haven't finished matric, you 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 mm -hmm. can, but like in a year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just something. It's like a, an empowerment kind of tool, you know, because mm -hmm. because on Hamilton Russell Vineyards, there's like this whole skills development vibe. You quickly catch on to it and just rubs off. So it came on to me. I worked it through to the other team and. Today, uh, two of those ladies, one is a tasting room manager rest, the other one works in the tasting room on weekends, and it's just some, some in type of empowerment and, and skill development. They learned about wine, now their children will learn about wine, and we are developing, uh, uh, I can almost say a people of color generation of wine. <laughs> Good, thinkers. great. Wine thinkers. Yeah. Um, but that happened that year, and Anthony included me in all of the tastings, um, I always joke about it, but I tell him I've heard the Hamilton Russell story and the and the wine information that year. I think one thousand one hundred times. <laughs> I know you, you said that year. You know, it, um, you might just say if you are getting bored, but I said no. I just want to just get it in, get it in because um, although I was included in every tasting every day, like almost four times a day, international wines. Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Chardonnay. Um, I didn't trust my opinion on the wine. I didn't trust what I was tasting. I didn't trust any of it. So I did uh, three three crash courses through the Cape Wine Academy. I mm -hmm. think it's the beginner course, and then it's a uh, food and wine, and then there's another one certificate, I think. Um, and also, um, so I used to drive through to Stellenbosch and Paul. They had tastings at the Niederberg Auditorium. I used to drive there every uh, Tuesday and Thursday after work because the tastings happened at about seven or something. I can't remember. Just to, just to taste, 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 taste. And Anthony also suggested do the smelling of the different fruits in the shops, you know, even if you don't buy it because I come from Tesla Zal again. There's only onions, wheat, and <laughs> there was narkis on the occasion. So, you know, just to broaden my, 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 my smell of things. And um, I can tell you, I think in the second year, I gained a bit of confidence where I could in other tastings kind of now give an opinion, kind of rate a wine. Um, my palate started, I think my palate probably developed in the first year, but hey, in the second year, I think something came to light. And um, then I did, as the time went by, I got nominated by Hamilton Russell Vignettes as I think the first person of color I may not speak under correction. In 2003, um, they had the thing where people from sellers could go to the International Wine and Spirits Fair uh, in the UK. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, it was in 2003. So I got, uh, got, got picked. And that was also my first international trip. So, um, you know, I'm in the wine industry. I'm learning. I'm working with the guys. I'm in the harvest, I'm running the logistics. I'm now the export logistical person. I'm the packaging person, packaging logistics. I worked in the tasting room. I did the stands for Hamilton Russell. And yeah, I went to the UK. Um, I can't remember much of that trip though, other than I was starstruck and I was international struck. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think I froze at, at Heathrow Airport because I, I flew alone. But um, what amazed me of that trip was well, uh, I, although I tasted international varieties already, 
what amazed me was the the hugeness or the range the range mm. I, I didn't know like the whole world will be in that one space i was i was completely struck and i can remember saying to talita uh, you know we are here but how do people know we are here if there is what seems to me like one million producers <laughs> and um they all actually sought out the Hamilton Russell vineyards wine people that came there knew about it and then she said to me well this is this is the wine business this is the wine industry you produce quality wines you get known and you get recognized and also how many years you are in the business and you know um how, uh, how Hamilton Russell started and it just gave me this huge respect I mean, I already had respect for the wine and the wine processing being assisting with the with the harvest. But to see this in 2003, just like two years after I've started in the wine industry was such had such a huge impact. Um, and I just wanted to know further. So, yeah, what I did um, in those years up until 2014 was to UNISA. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bad sleeper, so I thought, hey, I've read all the thriller books in the world and I've Actually, I've read one of yours, Genesis. Anthony gifted me one. <laughs> um, I started uh, also studying just like import, export, logistical, um, higher certificate through, through UNISA. Um, so no, I don't have a winemaking degree or anything like that. But what I, what I do or what I bring to the table is really the logistical, uh, logistical side of things. And then I also ran my own department on Hamilton Russell. Um, so you do the budgeting and the financing for that. And it all goes together. The business heavy side of things basically came from Talita. So I can basically name everyone like the entertainment side I saw from Oliver Hamilton Russell. And um, yeah, so in 2014, Anthony said, look, Barin, you've got no more place to grow. Why don't you start your own business as a wine producer? So produce a barrel of wine in our cellar, but you have to get your own grapes, get your own company registered. You can use a building here at the bottom here for your liquor licensing. Um, and he knew I could do it because I used, I was involved with all other legalities um, and stuff. Um, he says, so this is the thing. Are you up for it? Um, come talk to me about the money. I'll give you the startup cost. After that, it's a business run by yourself. No interference from Hamilton Russell Vignettes. Um, just opportunities, opportunities, empowerment, empowerment. I immediately jumped onto this wagon. Um, I, I think I, I'm not a I'm not an emotional person that shows really emotion other than hugs and and laughs. But I think that I I, I think I shed a tear because I'm thinking, wow, <laughs> someone yeah like out of the blue. I mean, what will this cost? Probably over hundred thousand, you know. And that was really um, the generosity. And just to quickly uh, not to draw, uh, draw off the topic, but I know Tim Hamilton Russell, Anthony's dad, and Anthony has been. I think it's in their genes to, to promote skills development because I know Tim Hamilton Russell, just to show what the small world this is, he fought for the dog stelsel to be removed mm. those years. Mm. He was instrumental in that. And Anthony, I mean, all of the wine producers in the Valley mostly come from Hamilton Russell. We've got Peter Finlayson at Bouchard Finlayson. We've got Kevin Grant, um, who also made his wine here. That has got Ataraxia wines further in the Yemelin Arda Ridge. We've got Hannah Storm, with whom I also worked with. He moved on to have Storm wines, also made his wine at Hamilton Russell Vineyards. We've got Emil Ross here now, who patiently um, helps me and make everything idiot proof. He's here. We've got me, um, who Anthony know. I, I am a type of person that there's the duty, get it done, type of shoulder kind of, kind of vibe. Yeah. Um, and um, qualities gets recognized and promotion um you know gets done empowerment and promotion so that's what happened i set out to get a wine uh, contract grapes uh, to get grapes i eventually found one like in the dead dead beats of time in november just before harvest with love edge so my grapes come from the yemelin are the rich pinot noir obviously because that's all i know really pinot noir and chardonnay um, and we've got the quality grapes. So I got that grapes in, it was just about a ton. I went to pick, to pick with uh, two French interns and Emil Ross. We got off just about a ton, got back here and we produced 1,202 bottles of Tesla Style Pinot Noir 2015. 
that was the maiden vintage. <laughs> I got my liquor license, I think, a year later, May 2016. And my business has ran ever since then with Anthony introducing me to all the wine journalists coming here. Everyone that basically visits Hamilton Russell Vineyards got introduced to Tesla Zal wines. Anthony used to say to me, Bereen, at every wine show that we're showing Hamilton Russell, have a bottle of Tesla Zal um, right. under the under yeah. the desk and show yeah. it. Um, and, and, and that's what happened. And I bought a piece of property um, in November 2019. I nearly wiped my business out, by the way. I couldn't get a loan. Uh, I have a car that belongs to the bank. And, you know, Tesla Zal only has the barrels for assets. And um, I'm thinking, gosh, how am I going to buy this piece of property in Tesla Zal of my hometown? Because I really want to go back there. I want to have a wine producing vineyard there. And I want to um, promote the, the, the youth. Well, especially, I'll probably be sexist by saying this, but I would like the female, the, the young female ladies, you know, to yeah. come and I want to inspire this generation of wine because, you know, females also get to be the mother and the mother must teach the child. Mm. Because also, unfortunately, in our culture, people of color, there is, many children growing up without dads including my own mm. i've got two boys yeah. so i i would like to be the first generational um wine estate in tesla's Dal, and that is only is happening because i was empowered by hamilton russell vignettes and by anthony hamilton russell and by this generational of wine produced thinking and also instilling quality wines being produced in a person, because that's the other point of, of, of priority. I mean, you can have a thousand wine labels per se, mm. but if they are producing mass production or wines that's not of a quality or not made from quality grapes, or is not specific on where it was placed, it could, it could hurt you in the end. Mm. So um, that thinking is the thinking that, it, uh, that I want to go out with. And I also want to be in the same I also want to give someone the same opportunity that was given to me. That um, sounds great. I was given a, a unique, unique yeah. opportunity of owning a wine business, man. I, who thought, uh, who knew? Yeah. Well, you've I, obviously got great managerial skills. So, you know, <laughs> you, you, you must put, and you obviously have the aim of putting them to good use. And yeah, spread, and spreading the word. So you know, uh, uh, I, I, I've got two sons. I would like them to take over the business, but you know, I must let them have their own identity. But I said, mm. said to Anthony the other day, uh, "Yeah, own identity is fine, but I feel like I must force them." <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that'll work. I no, no, I, gotta... <laughs> won't. I won't. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very, very much for sharing. That is such an inspiring story. As as are all of these stories, actually. Um, but just to get a break by being an au pair and coming from such an interesting place is really uh, unique. Yeah, can, I add some, can I add something? Yes, briefly. <laughs> briefly I'll, I'll do it quick. Yeah. Just to say, um, there's about five customers in Tesla's Bar buying Tesla's Bar wines, and they are all beer drinkers. <laughs> so maybe I'll sway them. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So thank you very much, Boreen. So Prezi, you also came from an area that was not, definitely didn't drink wine, did you? And you were surrounded by sugarcane, I think, originally, rather than vines. Is that right? That's right. That's very much correct. Um, thank you, Janssen, and thank you um, to Waza for having this platform. We are really um, grateful that we get to um, impart on the, our journeys and experiences with where we're going as a South African uh, wine industry. Um, and uh, I just want to say, yo, <laughs> being a third speaker after um, all these amazing stories, it's sort of like, oh, what do you say after that? Um, <laughs> well, yours is but... <laughs> different. You have a different story. <laughs> yes, no, 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 that's true. Um, and uh, and I think um, my story is actually not as much as sort of, um, we share similarities with Kiara, um, but I grew up in the Northern KZN, um, KwaZulu Natal, one of the provinces in South Africa. Um, as Yansa have said, it's a sugarcane land. So basically, we grew, I grew up in the farming space. 
Um, so farming has always been uh, in, in within my um, space, and but in sugarcane. And in 2004, I came to study um, winemaking in uh, Elsenburg. And why? Because... What made you do that? <laughs> Um, I think when I, I applied between Elsenberg and Stellenbosch University, and then obviously because I'm a very much more practical person, um, even if when someone explains something, I have to sort of like create a picture in my mind for me to understand. So then I said, okay, number one, I don't know how the vines look like. So it will make no sense that I go sit and listen to the lecture talking about vines when I haven't even seen how these vines look like. So the best way to do this is just actually to go where the vines are. And um, and everyone thought I was crazy because I was like, why would you choose a college of a university? And I'm thinking if I can get the same qualification, why not? And uh, so, and I've always been the person who, when the way is this way, you just follow the different direction or challenge where what the, um, the usual is. So I then went to Elsenberg and boy oh boy when I got there I was like I wasn't expecting this much for me place looking like so I was like should I still stay or should I just go and then I all said well you've already made your bet so might as well stick it out and um, I enrolled within um, at Elsenberg and it was an amazing experience I think the three years of, of my, the best of my life because um, I wouldn't have been I, I wouldn't have understood winemaking and the growth of the vineyards if I haven't gone there because but you had to um, learn a whole new language didn't you <laughs> that was another another uh, challenge on its own you know um and I was saying to a friend of mine uh last week actually said you know how 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 life works is that a person who used to teach you your lecture and um and when you raise your hand and say, can you please uh, repeat that in English? And they'll say, well, you've got a textbook, right? And then just go read your textbook. And then I said, years later, you work with the same lecture as now your viticulturist. Um, that's when I moved to Distel. And, and, and then we laughed about it because then obviously that time we colleagues now, we no longer the lecturer and, and the student. But, but I think um, it, you've got to have the resilience inside of you because um, if, if, if you don't have that, anything that comes your way or anything that might challenge you, you will easily, you know, back down. And then I, I tried, I uh, packed all my bags the first um, uh, quarter of the year, and then I went home and my mom um, that time, she said, well, what are you gonna do since now you don't wanna go back? And I said, well, I'll figure out what I'm gonna do. I wanted to do chemical engineering, so I can always do that. <laughs> and she's like, no, there's no option. So literally I came back and um and 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 since then i um i fell in love with what with what the western cape is and i get exposed to both provinces the western cape and the kzn and i said you know i will still choose being here purely because um as much as kzn can give you the contrast of um the mountains and the green plantations i think here is a combination of everything involved and the growth opportunities that a person can have um, and and you don't even see yourself that you're not part of this space because you can easily gel in with the with the local people and and then especially also if you have people around you that are for you and for your growth and development it makes it a bit better but I'm not saying that it's without challenges that we face as human beings each and every day um, so then after I graduated of uh, viticulture and enology um, at Elsenberg, I joined uh, the Cape Omegas Guild as a protege. Um, and also, as Kiara has said, without dwelling much on it, it's, it's, it's really a stepping stone. It's, it's that um, amazing platform that helps you to distinguish between what is quality winemaking. Because, I mean, you don't know where you're going to end up. You know, I've been through different... Um, uh, companies have worked in different spaces. So as long as you know when you're making wine that you can still make an amazing barrel of wine of high end quality and you can still make a big massive volume and also still make it as good as you can make that barrel of wine. That I call is actually being a diverse winemaker because everyone needs that. So I think for me, it was a very good platform that I, get, I got to be exposed to that kind of experience. And three years after I finished with the protege program, I joined the cell. Um, it was um, it was a very um, amazing experience. I remember when I spoke to um, one of the mentors at the time, uh, Peter Ferreira, when I asked him, should I go work for the cell? Because everyone had the thing that oh, the cell is just volume driving. And he said, you know what, Prezi, um, 
if you don't go there, you wouldn't, you would not know how is it like to work in a place like that. And at the same time, also, it will broaden your experience as to what you would know, because the state as a company is diverse and it's got a lot of opportunities internally. So it was a good experience. I worked there for six years. Um, I started in white wine um, uh, uh, as a white wine assistant winemaker, moved to the red wines, moved to uh, managing the bottling line. And, and, and then I was like, you know, I, in the midst of everything, I had an amazing gift with an amazing uh, boy. And I said, you know, winemaking, sometimes it, it takes more of your time that you don't get to actually be as close to your children. Um, and then so I decided to then step away from uh, winemaking just for that moment because I needed to help him grow. And I also um, went into an amazing space that I think a lot of people take for granted, but it plays a very integral role within the winemaking space. I worked for Anchor Unology that actually um, gives consultation and advice to winemakers as to what you can use in order to maintain consistency in your winemaking um, career as, as weather changes or as years changes. Because the amazing thing is that once you bottle a wine, year on year or year after vintage after vintage, you have to be consistent. And irrespective of this year, the harvest is longer than last year, irrespective whether you've got rains or not, irrespective whether you've got drought as well, you have to maintain all of that. So I think um, having worked um, at Anchor to, to see what options as a winemaker do you have to maintain that. And also, I mean, I looked after Hermanas or Overberg. It, gotten, it, it exposed me to the different styles of wines that you get in that area versus to what you used to in Wellington, where I am at the moment. And when you actually taste the wine like blind or you know a Chardonnay in the, in the, in the Overberg or in the Hermanas area is this way and in Wellington is this way, it's an amazing kind of knowledge that a young winemaker should have. Because as you work, you need to know what you're given and how to handle it for you to be able to, 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 to do justice and, and, and give the consumer or the people that will enjoy uh, the best that you can. So then after that, I think uh, while I was still there, um, and then also while I was at Anchor, I got to travel. So, I mean, that Heathrow Airport, I know it very well. <laughs> you used to have long layovers and you'll sit for six hours and then you like, you know, charge your phone, charge your laptop and start working. So I got to be exposed to that as well. And I think when um, Berin was saying that when you want to expose your children so they can find their own identity, I said to my kids, um, when they finish matric, that's a year to go, a long to go now. But I said, I'll buy them a one-way ticket to wherever they want to go. And I said, it's up to you how you make your, your way back. <laughs> but you've got to work your way back. <laughs> that's brave. <laughs> and, and, I said, and I said, you can call me, but, but I think it's important because it will, for me, traveling outside South Africa, it makes you look at your circumstances or the, the, what, what's around you in a very different way. It opens your mind to something so that you don't look at it in a narrow focus, but you, you've got these blind spots that you take mind of or cognizant of. So, so that's what for me traveling in different countries um, through um, Anchor has done in, in that space and tasting different wines as well. I mean, seeing how a Riesling in South Africa behaves versus a Riesling in Germany um, and what to do actually to get that kind of style. So then um, while I was still enjoying the Anchor and the traveling and everything, um, I um, got a call from uh, Adamo Wines and, and at the time they, um, they needed or they were looking for someone to, 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 to spearhead the, uh, the project that they were busy with, um, which is an amazing, amazing project. I think it's, 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 it's a really example of a genuine relationship or partnership. That it, what you can do if you, 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 you take different, um, um, different, different people and put them together, you can actually walk a long mile. Um, and Adama Wines is literally um, more focusing on what hundred like females, young people that are professional in their own skill set. When you put them together to run a company, what it can do for for our South African space, and also empowering or giving that ownership to the farm people, because always we've been taught that you 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 study and you go work for someone, but then when you work in a space or in a in a company that you actually 
um, are part of. It, it's an amazing feeling because then you understand what it means to run a company that is partly yours because you don't have you know that if I don't do this who's going to do it and mm. you push yourself to 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 where you didn't think you would um so I think joining Adama Wines and what Adama Wines stands for um together with Bosman Adama that actually offers us that mentorship and also that uh, value chain support because the important thing is that as Brina said if you don't have that support system that is able to elevate you and able to to support you when challenges come because we all know in business challenges do come i mean we've been hit by the pandemic covid and then mm. if you are still alone business and it's very hard to actually survive those kind of challenges but if you have a support system that is going to offer you either it, I mean, from economic point of view, from social point of view, to sustain you so that you can be able to 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 go forward. And I mean, my mentor mentor right now, I mean, uh, Petrus is uh, I don't want to blow a, a trumpet, but he's he's really it's family first, you know that. And and also it's like how do you put the two together where you still do what you need to do, but at the same time, you can be able to be a mother and do the things that you need to do with your kids. Um, and I think it's not all the employ the places that can, can offer that. So um, I think, but what it does for a young person, it makes you dream bigger than wh where you are. It's like when you, when you, when you vision, um, when you're allowed to vision, to look at things or to see things that are not yet existing, you know, and, and you're like, how do we make this happen? And then you've got someone who's, who actually says, okay, let's try that, you know, because all the time when, when you want to do something, you thought, oh, but there's not this, you can't do that. So it's like, let's try it and let's make it work because you are seeing it before it exists. You will make sure that it does come to pass. So I think, um, I think that for me is when you take young people and you empower them with skills and you, you give them experience and you give them support, it builds an amazing foundation for them to be able to run something or a business that they can, that can be able to live on for generation and generation. And it makes them proud as well because, um, because when you, have, when you see something in front of you that you were part of from before you even thought it would exist, to actually it coming to existence and thinking how far you can take it is an amazing kind of um, feeling. Yeah. So in it does sound great, and I love the idea of having an, um, a, a structure which allows you to be a mother as well as a, <laughs> a family member, as well as an effective team member. Yeah. In general, putting aside Adama wines, in general in South African wine. Are you optimistic about the progress being made in, in terms of empowerment and upliftment? I think um, if you look at, basically when I started here, um, when I came into Western Cape in 2004 and dating backwards to probably the times, because I've got friends who, were, who came to Western Cape before my time. And to look when I see now where I am, there's been an improvement. Um, yes, obviously, it's, it's not happening probably at a rate that a lot of people would have hoped, or maybe the rate that it should. But for every, if you look at even the black on brands, I mean, how far we've come to having them um, 60 or more brands existing now to probably 10 years ago or even 15 years ago. Um, I think the important question or the important mandate for everyone is that how do we sustain that? Or how do we make sure that it doesn't end by a company, Adama Wines, but there's more Adama Wines coming on board, not only with the partnerships of the likes of Bosman Adama or and the Dynasty Trust or whoever, but are we championing this in the right way that the next person says, you know what, if Adama Wines can exist for five years and still run a sustainable business and with a great future ahead of them, probably then it's a good platform for me to also start something similar. Mm. Because if we can be a lot of us who does that, and, and I can tell you this, without partnerships, not only for a brand, but from farming point of view, if you get a right farmer to partner with you and stand with you for the right values, the right reasons, then it, it can actually um, shield you from a lot of things that could go wrong. Because if it's not the space that you know, 
you need someone who knows that space best for them to advise you and to, to, to show you the way forward. Mm. Well, maybe we should talk to Petrus and uh, see what he's, uh, how he's seeing the future. How about you, Petrus? Thank you so much, Crazy. That's lovely. And uh, thanks for the opportunity, um, Jansis, and being part of this, um, this talk. Um, obviously, I'm from a very different background, um, I could, could say a privileged background. And, but um, yeah, I had a real passion for wine. And my grandfather made wine into the mid 50s. And my dad always said, we can, when we come back to the farm, um, we can make wine again. And um, obviously, joining, um, joining the, when I finished um, university, a lot of my friends went abroad. Um, it was really the, the brain drain of South Africa. And I um, think being yeah, lured into this wine, wine yeah, making wine again, and actually joined, joined the family business. And um, also want to make a change to, into South Africa and the, the context and make it sustainable because yeah, I'm the age generation and as a family business, you think about the, the future. And um, for us, empowerment was really about making the cake bigger, um, creating opportunities. And we were quite fortunate at that time um, to have the opportunity where yeah, government also got involved and we, um, our employees, um, yeah, we could up, were brought into the business. And um, it really set the platform to, to grow. Um, my two other brothers also joined the, the business and we invested significantly vertically yeah, in, yeah, into the wine making space, but also into plant improvement. And yeah, subsequently the, the business has, has grown significantly. And I think ultimately you need, you need growth um, to, to create employment, to create opportunity. And, um, and over the last 10, 12 years, um, I was having those opportunities. It's a lot of, I think it was quite fulfilling to see how, um, yeah, staff um, and employees, but as part of taking, taking on these opportunities, like in, in the plant improvement lab, as water boys, in the, in the cellars, um, as, um, in, in finance, um, and I think that's that's kind of how Adama Wines also started. So suddenly you have a group of, um, into, I don't know why, but um, coincidentally it's mo mostly women at that some professional young women, and so, but so you can also buy, we've got all the skills, finance, winemaking, um, logistics, um, viticulture, why don't you start something on your own? And that is kind of how Doma once um, started that crazy is um, heading up now. But um, yeah, at the same at the same time, um, I think from from Bosman's side, we um, yeah, we, I think we, we still believe in in um, creating an environment um, of where where everyone can learn and can can add can add value. Um, I think, you know, again, going back to when we started, I think if you, if you look, look for a partner in business, you, you want some, someone you can trust and can add value. And I think we, I was quite fortunate, we were quite fortunate that um, it's not only my family that's been living here for a long time, but uh, many of the um, families that work here has been living and working here for, for generations and um, to five generations. So, and the work that my father and um, um, yeah, even up to great grandfather was very much on the liberals, liberal side, and they believed in education, education of um, and training of, of the of the staff, and so that kind of um, laid the, the platform for for us to to work from. So the, the trust was there, and now if you empower by by education and learning. I, I think the, the business also, yeah, benefit and is able to able to grow. Um, what so can, it's really a fulfilling journey. That's great. What what can be done to encourage more wine producers in your position to take to copy your attitude and actions? 
Yeah, I, I think there's, there's um, many um, wine producers quite open to, to um, transformation. I think the challenge is, is, is um, I think, as I said, so we were fortunate with the timing. I think government um, was, was still, um, at, had more money at that time, um, pre-2009. Pre um, but um, currently you need to be very creative um, to Adama wants, uh, as in, we haven't got any any funding or we just trade ourselves into into liquidity really and it's 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 tough um and the business case for wine is is a lot tougher um of in the pandemic now but uh, so although you've got all that uh, hole to fill in china now that the australians can't export there you can send no, i think south africa's doing a bit not lovely. that not that easy if you can't travel and foster new relationships um but yeah, there's definitely opportunity. Um, so I think where we've gone, um, we've um, we've seen that there is a good appetite. But um, yeah, and, and there, there is. I think that way South Africa, in a way, is kind of leading the world in transformation. We've we've tried many models, many that didn't work, but there's also some that did work, as you've heard today, and um, beautiful stories. So. I think it's just being open, being interested, being curious, and 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 it's about trust. Um, I think <laughs> trusting that an individual or a group of individuals, um, allowing them to make their own choices and and be there to to support them and mentor them in a, 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 a and on the, on the path ahead. Are the stories that we've heard three fantastic stories today? Um, and doubtless there are more. Are they widely known and circulated within South Africa? Yeah, I think unfortunately not. Um, I think the South African, um, yeah, I think media always works on, on the negative news, although they, they are, there is a constant effort to, to, to circulate them, but and they, they are being shared. But, uh, I think the challenge really is for these brands to become. It's the South African wine market is, is really competitive. I think there's more than eight thousand labels, and to to stand out, um, it's 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 a it's a long it's a long way, um, long path. Uh, we think sometimes it's even e the export market is easier um, in a more organised market like the UK, um, but. Um, Although it too is very competitive. It's an African context, so. Yeah. Mm. Well, I, it's been very uplifting for me to hear all the stories and, and to hear what you've done. I think we have a few questions. Is that right, Jo? We do, indeed, yeah. Um, so um, we've got a few. I'll probably look at the ones that are still broadly on the topic. Um, so if I don't get to everything with apologies but we'll start with a question from uh, Richard Banfield and Richard says um, these are highly inspiring and heartwarming testimonials beautiful and impressively articulated if I may say so to what extent can Kiara, Barine and Prezi influence the South African government's apparently entrenched anti-wine and alcohol policies I think Chiara ought to have a word because I, I was very anxious about timing and so I don't think we heard enough from you, Chiara. Are you going to unmute yourself? Yeah. Um, man, I don't, at the moment, I don't think really that there's much that we can do to influence um, the government's take or anti-wine or alcohol policies. I think as an industry, as a wine industry, we need to maybe do better. There needs to be more conversation between the government and our wine industry bodies on what we can do together um, to move forward. So, yeah, I, that's, my, that's my take on that. 
and maybe get some of you on those all important committees and mm -hmm. and yeah um advisory bodies if you're not there already yeah your, your voices need to be heard more now shall i uh, joe are you going to keep, keep yes. feeding no, the questions um but you know on that subject i think it's quite interesting from an international perspective that that we kind of understand that not only is wine kind of so far removed from your childhood experiences but that it is actually seen as dangerous um and something that you're you know you're steered away from and i think that's something that's it's quite alien to you know sitting here in the uk and i think in other european markets but it's i think that's quite an interesting angle for us to be aware of in terms of you know, communicating successes and those kinds of things. Um, but right, on to, so we have a um, question from Fiona Beckett, and she says, so very impressed by these stories and achievements. What about young men of colour in the business? Are they coming through too? Um, I don't know who, who would have a, a view or response there. Yara's busy nodding. <laughs> um, I just like to say that there are some great young men of color coming through at the moment and working really hard. Um, there's a guy that's also now that, that graduated from the protege program, Baneli Bakili, and he's now just started his own label. Um, there's guys like Wade Sander that's got his own Brunier wines as well. Um, there's this guy currently just finest wines and he's not a winemaker as well. He's a business owner a wine brand owner like Purim, and he's doing some really amazing things, pushing his wines out there, and they're really good as well. So yes, we do have the guys coming through. <laughs> nice and, and so do they, well. do they need mentoring or support in any way, or do you think they're well on the way without it? No, no, actually, um, so the gentleman from Kyolicha's Finest Wines, he's working with a sommelier who's got some connections in the industry as well, that's helping him. Um, and then Banele is the assistant winemaker now. He's taken over from my position at Savage Wine. So uh -huh. Duncan is also yeah. assisting him with his brand, showing him the ropes a little bit there. Yeah. He's in good hands there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've got two guys in the Yemlin Arda, um, Earl Hansen and uh, Kirsten Maiber. And they are both employed at Creation Wines. And they have wines out, I think, since two years ago. Their own label, um, they are making the wines, producing at uh, creation. And they are also like the assistant winemakers to Gerard and uh, JC. So I know they, their wines is also out. They're not known, really. I don't think they've done much marketing on that. But I know they had some good wines. It's a one Pinot Noir, and the other one, I think, is a wooden Sauvignon Blanc. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's actually probably more difficult to sell wine than to make it, I would. That is true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, not that I have ever managed to do either, but um, certainly in the, the modern crowded marketplace, I think it's really difficult to make an impression. But, you know, with lovely stories like this, perhaps that would help. What else, Joe? Okay, so we have a question from um, Sarah Thornby, who is the Lou Wines, I believe. Um, Kiara, Barine, and Prezi, you're all really inspiring and have obviously worked very hard to be successful. What are the challenges still facing people of colour wanting to work in the wine industry and what needs to be done to break them down? Again, that's quite a, a, a big yeah. question. So is anybody keen to... Maybe Prezi can help unmute yourself there. yeah sure it, it, it is a very um big question i i think um it, it's gonna take the willingness to get into a space um where you're gonna have to you're gonna have to start somewhere and by starting somewhere is i think the barrier that we need to break first is uh, the social barriers where we're all comfortable with each other because I think um, um, 
you've got to get a willing participant um, from both sides. Um, and it, once you have that partner, that person that you can work with who is willing, then um, I, I think challenges like when you're planting the vineyards, you don't have water or challenges like you probably don't know certain things about business that that person can help you, then you can breach those. But it, it, it starts from being willing. Um, and, I, and, and I think I'm not sure um, where we go, where we are with that, but we're just hoping that us who are already in the space, we and we are we are as resilient and we show this tenacity in not giving up, irrespective of of, of what come may, because at the end of the day, it, it running a business is like any other person. If you don't sell, you won't have money to grow. Um, and, and, and I think it's not about whether you are of color or you were born in the Western Cape or within the, the, the farm community. It's, 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 the challenges are the same. They, they really have no, 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 no color. So I think once we, 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 we breach that we want to grow as a, a, a generation, always a nation that was not within the farming community of the Western Cape. And then you've got the willing participant to say, you know what, I'm willing to be with you and help you and grow with you and groom you. Then I think we can go somewhere. Um, other things you, you can be able to tackle. I do believe that, yeah. Do any of you think that among white South Africans, there's a, a generational difference that younger white South Africans are more open and less entrenched and perhaps prejudiced in their views. Do you see a change? Well, um, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll maybe just probably just start and say within the, the people that we studied with, because obviously, as I said, when I studied, um, I was the only black girl in class. And, and in that, it was intimidating. And, I, and, and it's, we laugh about it now, you know, then it, it was not a joke because um, you were very much intimidated. And that doesn't end because you still go sit um, on the table where you're sitting with this um, grown man and, and where you have to meet each other halfway. But you know what I think is amazing? What's amazing is when you're sitting with um, the, 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 the farmers that are older than you, older to be your grandfather, and they're trying to speak English. Um, I speak English. I don't really speak a lot of Afrikaans. And when they're trying to speak English, even though it's broken or it is, I appreciate that. It makes me want to work hard to learn Afrikaans because I'm like, we can only meet each other halfway and I think once we have that because that means I can I'm willing to accommodate you I'm willing to sit around the table have coffee with you and then we discuss how do we take this relationship further um, but within our generation itself I think because the integration was already started by the time that everyone has to get used to crazy bring the only girl in there and the amazing thing is when we made when I made the, the wine in the cellar I was paired with another guy who was not black, who was not um, uh, English, who was Afrikaans. And today, when we meet each other at the shop, you're like, hey, how are you? Because then you already gone over that uncomfortable um, space of you are coming from this other generation or this other culture, we're not the same. Because I think if you look at South Africa as a whole, we've got 11 different cultures. So within the black community itself, we are different. So just because I'm Zulu and then there's a Tswana, a Venda, a Tosa or whatever person, already that's creating another difference or barrier. Just because now you are not the same color as me, that's like you're used to being the fact that we are all different. So, so I, I think it, we, we, we shouldn't over, um, um, overemphasize, not overemphasize, but we shouldn't entertain the fact that just because you have different color, you're different. We are different in any way within our own spaces because I'm Zulu, I don't speak Afrikaans, but then my colleagues are Afrikaans. So what do we, what do we say now? We don't gotta speak to each other because we're not speaking the same language. We've gotta find a way to help and meet each other halfway. I think that's where it begins, irrespective of what color are you. Yes, it plays a role in some instances, but I don't think it should be the, the big factor. Yeah. Mm. Bereen, you wanted to say something. I, I just wanted to follow on uh, Praise's um, uh, uh, comment where she said uh, the willingness, which is important. Um, I, I agree 100%. I also want to say, Jancis, for South Africa as a whole, 
um, you know, most of the children are in governmental schools, uh, the primary school and uh, secondary or high school. And um, I think they must be introduced because there's that those schools are so overcrowded. And it's mostly the uh, children there from the uh, poor communities. It, it could be perceived that wine is only enjoyable for a certain class, you know, wine. And I think that's the biggest problem at the moment because not, not a lot of people would venture into something that they don't know because they don't have the confidence. And especially, especially going back to, not to bring color in, but, but people of color, I know my peers would all have been scared to venture into agriculture and into the wine industry. And I think we must go back to the schools really um, and introduce, uh, uh, go back to career days with these schools um, on the Cape Flats where there's a big, big problem. Um, and yeah, in the Overberg, in, I know Caledon in the Overberg has got classes where they introduce agriculture, like more to the wheat side of things, you know. Um, but no one really knows about viticulture and no one really knows about the wine industry and not really many gets to year of, you could really with a bursary still, we still have that problem. So I think we need to go back to the youth, back to the schools, introduce these kind of things and actually send a message out that wine can be enjoyed throughout every, um, how can I say, every class if I can put it at that. And people only enjoy a wine really and go into these training or mentoring stuff with an open mind if they understand the wine and get the uh, appreciation and actually know to, to read the label of the wine and to have wine with food, going back to teaching to, to eat at the dinner table. Um, I think stuff like this should happen in school really. And from there they would know of CWG uh, learner programs, proteges. So I would say awareness, yeah. That sounds ideal, but it doesn't sound as though the government's going to be very keen on it <laughs> no. at the moment. Uh, should we move on to another, Joe? Although Petrus, do jump in with any thoughts, won't you? Yeah, yeah I think Joe. Joe, your sound's off. Um, no, no, I can just, uh, um, I think it is, uh, I completely agree with, um, with Berin, um, but it, uh, yeah, it's from where we now, it's a big challenge to get that level of education, but that is, I think that is the future. Um. Sorry, I just realized I had my sound off. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think everyone should have their sound on, actually, yeah. all panelists, so that you can jump in if necessary. Have we another question? Yeah, so we have a question from um, Jo Locke at the Wine Society, and she says, um, for Chiara, Barine and Prezi, do you think young people are still having to make the stark choice you made to embrace wine rather than avoid it? Or is wine now seen in a more positive light, both as a beverage and a career? Chiara. Um, I think that the more positive stories like Berins and Praises and myself get out there, the more they will see wine in a positive light and be encouraged to enter into the wine industry, whether it be in winemaking or whatever other avenues we have in the industry. I myself have had, has had a very positive or have had very positive feedback where um, there was an article posted some time ago and this young woman reached out to me on Instagram and said to me that she was actually currently studying something else at a university. She wanted to do winemaking and we had a similar background, similar story and she thought that she wouldn't be accepted and couldn't do it and after reading my story in this publication she decided now that she's actually going to study winemaking. Um, so I think the more good news is put out there, it will definitely change the perception of people and they be more attracted to the wine industry. Um, and, then, and would any of our other panelists 
just want to comment on that or should we? I think maybe let's go on to the next. I'm sure okay. no one disagrees with what Chiara said. <laughs> Um, so also, again, still from Joe, um, for Petrus, have your positive efforts been in any way impacted by some of the less successful BEE initiatives we saw in the early post-apartheid days? What makes the difference to how well such initiatives work? That's a good question. Yeah, no, de definitely. I think the perception of, of wine, and even you can call it black and brands haven't always been that positive. And obviously there's been challenges initially. So it's even you know, with, with lower quality now we, or associate with lower quality. So I think that, that, that is a challenge where it's, I think it's quite the opposite. If people are vested in, in the work they do and they take ownership, the quality is actually better um, and should be better. And I think we, we see a new generation as, as today coming through making exceptional wines. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, as, as I said, unfortunately, it's always um, when people hear like economic empowerment, there's a negative a, a project that failed um, or yeah, something that just didn't work out. So, yeah, I think that the difference is it, it's not something that you just do and leave it. Um, you, um, it's a journey um, and it's, it's every day that you need also bring your contribution. Um, we have lots of meetings. Um, I th in our case, it's with, with, um, with the, in, in, in the broad base empowerment with the, with the trustees and so it's a, it's a continuous process, but it's also a very rewarding process. Um, it, it could be financially, but I think the reward really lies and to see people develop and taking taking ownership. Um, so it's, it's, it, I think it's about the mindset. I think unfortunately also in the beginning, there was a bit of opportunism, um, people exploiting um, if they were, obviously if there's um, cheaper capital available, it, it's going to be a, a uh, yeah, yeah, probably an avenue that's pursued. So, and I think that makes it difficult because um, it's difficult to dis, dis, um, to distinguish between the intention at, at the start um, for the, the, the funder. But um, again, I think there's some learnings as we see more and more blended funds um, coming available now from government or government private financing um, options. So we have the yeah, we have more and more funding avenues um, based on commercial terms. Mm. I think it looks as though there's um, another good question from Fiona, Joe, that maybe you can answer. Yes, so um, Fiona Beckett is asking, um, what is Woza, Wines of South Africa, doing to promote new winemakers of colour in the UK? Are there more agencies taking them on? Um, and this also, I think, slightly relates to the question from Adam Kakalde. Sorry, apologies, Adam. <laughs> um, which is that he is essentially saying that it seems to be that central to it is reputation and potential sales. Um, stories sell wine, but they need to be told. And I think those two things um, come together. And I think from... Wines of South Africa's programs, we're always very um, conscious of ensuring that we are promoting um, companies that support transformation. So we will always try to get um, those stories and the wines in front of journalists. Um, certainly in more normal times when we're able to do live events, that's um, a little easier, but it's um, still very much part of our mandate. Um, supporting those businesses in terms of market insight. So being able to talk about, you know, how the UK is structured, which sectors work best, um, and then putting those stories out on social media. And I think all of our panels today we've um, worked with because it's, it's the balance of getting the wines into the market in the first place, which is often the, the most difficult bit, um, and then being able to 
talk to the merchant, tell those stories. But from my perspective, if the wines aren't here, that's, you know, that's, that's not something that's going to really add value. So I think it's that, that whole process of getting the wines across. Um, and as we've all said, in, in very competitive um, environment, but I think I felt it's very interesting what our panel have talked about today in terms of that focus on quality and being exposed to quality wines through programs like the Cape Winemakers Guild Protégé because I think that's what we're seeing here today is that when the quality is there, the wines, the wines get listed, there's so much interest. So I guess it's just trying to build, build on that as well. Real chicken and egg, isn't it? I know from where I sit, you know, yeah. lots of people, they kind of want me to rate a wine or write about it to help them get distribution, but then from my relationship with my readers, it's rather tantalizing to tell them about a wine that they can't actually find. So, yeah. yeah. Any more questions, Joe? Uh, let's have a quick look. And this will, this, this session's being recorded, isn't it? So anyone, any, anywhere, if, if I publish a link to it and we all publish links to it, you know, Americans will still be fast asleep, but they can, they can join it. Subsequently, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so it will be put up on the Wines of South Africa website um, shortly, and um, we'll be able to link through to that. So we'll we'll make sure we share that with you all, and we'll obviously be be putting that on social media as well because yeah, we've had a lot of interest from the likes of North America as well. Good, but fantastic. Well, uh, amazingly, for the first time ever, we seem to be on time to finish <laughs> <laughs> the webinar. <laughs> Um, so from our side, I just want to say thank you so much to our panel today for your time and efforts. Um, it's hugely appreciated. So Kiara, Barine, Crazy and Petrus, thank you very much. Um, and enormous thanks to you as well, Jancis, um, for your time. It's hugely appreciated. And I think I've already had messages coming through saying it's been a fantastic, such a fascinating webinar. So um, thank you very much. And obviously people know where Wines of South Africa is if you've got any other questions that we haven't addressed. Great to see you. Wonderful to thank listen you to you much. too. Thank you. Thank Have you. Hey. Yeah. Bye.